Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechX webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of what various domains. The agenda of today's session is Microsoft Project 2010 Live Web Radio. Ask questions, get answers from Microsoft Project experts. Our guest speaker is Mr. B. Sai Prasad, Senior Manager, Learning and Development, Cognizant Technology Solutions, India Private Limited. B. Sai Prasad, Senior Manager, Learning and Development, has been with service provider Cognizant Technology Solutions, India Private Limited since 2001, where he was named winner of the company's Global Trainer of the Year Award. He is a Microsoft Certified Te Technology Specialist in Project 2007 and Project 2010. He started the mic first Microsoft Project User Group India chapter to promote and help practitioners within and outside India on Microsoft Office projects. Let's quickly take up the questions now. Please read out the questions and their answers so that all our users may listen to the commendable insights. Over to you, Mr. Sai. So good evening to one and all for joining today on this program on the Microsoft Project Live Web Radio. So we are going to look at uh, more answering your questions on this tool called Microsoft Project 2010. So the key takeaways of this program is something for a surprise. So we are just going to focus on answering all your questions which I will be receiving through your Q&A options. So the only request from each one of you is let's make it as interactive as possible. Please go to your go to meeting and on your Q&A tab just post your questions what you have on project 2010. And if you are having questions on other aspects of project management like PMP or project 2003 or project 2007, please feel free to share those questions also. So I just prepared a few set of questions what I've received from my earlier participants and from this program and let's get started with the first question first. So the first question what I have on the screen is so what are the common keystrokes that are available that can save some time when it comes to scheduling. I'm going back to my project 2010. So one of the more very common keystrokes what I ideally use when we to save time is the insert key. I hope uh, most of us when you would like to add new rows as a part of your schedule, you might follow this approach of selecting that row and you might do a right click and you might say insert task. So this might look like a roundabout way of doing it. Rather I suggest just position your mouse, your cursor to the row where you want to insert it and on your keyboard just press insert. The moment you do that insert automatically a new row gets added. On just the opposite side, if you just want to delete the task, you just press the delete button after you have selected that particular row. So which means this row is going to be automatically deleted in this case. The second option which I would like to talk about is the autocorrect option. I hope uh, participants who have joined my earlier program would have seen it. So I'm just going to recap on those options what I've done. So let's say that if you have a few set of task names that is very, very a common task names what you use, for example, um, conducting a workshop or a feasibility study or a research or a preparing a document. So there are certain common terms what we might use in our task names. So you don't want to type the complete task name, maybe you want to save some time in those aspects. For example, if I just say TP in my case, automatically the uh, name of the task, the task automatically changes to prepared document. How does this happen? So this option is not new to Microsoft Project 2010. It is even available in Word and Excel also. So the way I do it is I go to the file backstage and you need to go to the options where you have an option called proofing. So through the proofing you have an option through which you can auto correct the entries what you make. So I click on the auto correct options. On the auto correct options I have just used a very simple command like when I enter TP just replace it with prepare document. 
So as you can see, I have a series of uh, commands what I ideally use that can save a lot of time when I prepare a schedule. The second uh, common uh, uh, option which I ideally use when it comes to preparing a schedule is the quick access toolbar. Remember this option is available only in Project 2010 where uh, if you have seen on the top uh, leftmost corner you can see there is a few set of options that are available. Most of the times uh, users of Project 2010 are not even aware of this op option that is lying on top of this ribbon. So these set of options that are grouped together is what we call as the quick access toolbar. So to predominantly see it on your screen, I recommend you just do a right click anywhere on your ribbon and you can see there is an option called show quick access toolbar below this ribbon. I suggest that you bring this quick access toolbar below this ribbon so that you are able to Just hold on guys, I see there is a small network issue, hold on. Okay, good. So I was just talking about the quick access toolbar where I did just did a right click on the somewhere on the, to, uh, the ribbon interface where I said show the quick access toolbar below this ribbon. You are able to see a new set of uh, options that are available here. So the advantage of using this quick access toolbar is you can be very selective about what option you want to see it. Uh, one of the common options I recommend is uh, when you work on Microsoft project there would be a requirement for you to filter or made want to group the activities based on some criteria. So the way you ideally group or filter is through this option that is available on the view ribbon where you have an option called filter and where you have an option called group. So the advantage of the filter is you can try to filter based on some criteria here. So uh, let's say if I'm trying to say I want to filter by let's say completed task. Okay, I hope you don't see any task displayed on my screen now because there is no activities that are completed in this project. So if I just want to uh, reset this filter to no filter, I can just press F3 on my keyboard. The moment I press F3, you are able to see the filter gets reset to no filter. So similarly, you might find for a shortcut for no group, but sorry, there is no shortcut key for resetting this group. So I suggest that you you try to just say, you no, know, just try to add this to your quick access toolbar, okay, so that you know, the moment you just try to click on no group here, automatically your activities are getting refreshed. So just to summarize, uh, make use of the insert or the delete option or press the F3 button or just add your favorite buttons to your quick access toolbar, okay. The question number two which I would like to take is, um, Maybe one of the participants has written to me saying uh, they have created a schedule for their project and they want certain activities to finish or start by a given date and what is the recommended approach for it. So let me go back to project. Um, so if you look at the, this current schedule, I ideally have around a set of tasks which has been linked and I have loaded some resources. So his requirement is he would like to have this uh, last activity prepare the detailed architecture to finish on or before an earlier date. So the approach what he was ideally following was he tried to uh, explicitly enter the date here. For example, he would ideally say this activity should be finished by 4th of July. The moment I say 4th of July, I hope you are able to find that uh, for that particular activity a constraint is automatically put. So as you can see on the indicators, this particular activity is having a small calendar icon and that indicator also says this task has a finished no earlier than constraint. So what does this mean? When you try to enter a start date or a finished date, project always assumes that that activity should not start before that particular date. So what does this imply for us? For example, let's say we have this prepare and review and we try to revise this estimate to for example uh, one day and uh, let's say one day
So as you can see, though these activities are all completing, so you can see my review SRS is completing on 29th itself. But you are able to see my prepare detailed architecture is still starting only on Tuesday. The reason is I have ideally provided a date because this activity cannot finish or start before the particular date. So whenever you have a um, requirement that an activity should uh, ideally finish by a given date or start by a given date, I request you to ask yourself if the date what you're going to enter is going to be a soft or a hard date. What I mean by a hard date is those dates which you need to comply to. There's no options available. Whereas a soft date is ideally, it's a date that is recommended, but you need to look at the feasibility before you give a response to the customer. So I'm going back to my last activity, prepare detailed architecture. So let me double click the task, which brings up the task information dialog. Here you have an option called advanced where you are able to find there is a constraint type available. So on the constraint type, you would be able to find there is a drop down available called constraint type through which you are able to see there are different constraints available in this particular drop down. So you will be able to see constraint type like as soon as possible, as late as possible and so on so. I request you each one of you to just take a look at the constraint type now. So you are able to find there are different constraints available here. By default, the constraint that will be put for a forward scheduling is as soon as possible. But the moment you try to enter a date here, let's say finish date or start date, automatically this activity needs to finish or start not before that particular date. So coming back to this example, when I double click this task for my advanced tab, you said it automatically had the constraint type as finish no earlier than, which means this activity cannot go start or finished before this particular date. So if I have a different uh, requirement, I would like to uh, have this activity not to finish uh, later than this date and I just want, an, uh, this is ideally a soft uh, uh, constraint that has been provided. I can just remove it from the constraint date and I can just change it to as soon as possible so that I just give freedom for this activity to start or finish on any date as per my requirement. So now I'm going to the deadline field where I'm just going to paste this particular date as this activity should finish on this particular date. So let me say okay. Now you're able to find this activity's start is respecting the predecessor which means it completes on 30th which means it starts on the next working day. But you can see the deadline date what I ideally had, the deadline date what I ideally had was having a small indicator. I hope all of you are able to find the place where I'm circling. You are able to find there is a small green color indicator available, right? So this green color indicator just rep represents that it is a deadline date. So the, the um, advantage of using this deadline is if any of the activities pushes this uh, prepare finish date to a later date, for example, I say it is five days. So the moment I do it, you are able to see my prepared detailed architecture finishes on a new date like uh, September 7th, which means it's uh, on or after this deadline date, you can see there's a small deadline indicator that is displayed on your first column. This tells you that this task has finished after this deadline date, what you have ideally set. So whenever you have a requirement for scheduling a uh, particular task in your project, to finish on or before a particular date or on or after a particular date, ask yourself if it is a hard date or a soft date and accordingly make use of the constraint type or the deadline feature. So before I go to the third question, let me look at my Q&A if any of you are having questions on from your own experience. Okay, so there are about a few set of questions, so let me read out. Do we uh, do we use any tools on my project management other than Microsoft Project? So this is a question from Dayananda Baraswaj. Yes, there are other tools available like Primavera. There is another tool called OpenProj. Primavera comes from Oracle and uh, uh, I can say the OpenProj is coming from, it's an open source project that is freely available. So you might find OpenProj is looking something very similar to your Project 2003 and Project 2007 
but it does not have the resource capability or the reporting feature what you are exper experiencing in Primavera or Microsoft project. There was another question coming from Saravana Kumar. Okay. Uh, how far project Microsoft product helps project managers to manage project apart from scheduling? So if you look at Microsoft project apart from scheduling, right? when I talk about scheduling, we are talking about the activities, we are talking about uh, the dates and the resource leveling features. Apart from it, it also has capability in terms of the communication management. As a part of the communication, you might want to look at the list of resources who are working on your activities. You might also want to look at creating different reports as a part of your project management. So there are a lot of visual reports available and tabular reports. And the third uh, part which can be handled by your Microsoft project is the cost management part. So as I'm going to just uh, talk about the earned value management, so we are going to focus on uh, how cost can be calculated based on the resources and the fixed costs available on your activities. So that is possible through Microsoft project. Where Microsoft project really does not fare well, I can say it does not more focus on the, I can say, the quality management part of it, okay, because it's not a quality management system. It's not talking about procurement, because there are separate systems available on within your own company which manages that. Maybe within your schedule, you can just add some line items or tasks that can manage, that can be an indicator that you need to track those items. Let me move to the next question. How do I run Scrum-based projects? Yeah, I'm just going to park this as a part of the next one question. What's the difference between PMP and PRINCE2? Okay, PMP ideally is coming from the um, from PMI and PRINCE2 is from Europe. So the difference is between, I can say, PMP is more of process driven whereas PRINCE2 is more task driven. So as you can see, PRINCE2 is more template driven approach where you need to have a lot of documents and where it more focus on how things should be done. Whereas PMP mainly focuses on what are the essential things but it does not drive deep into the different aspects of project management at the lowest level because it is more focusing at a very broad spectrum in terms of how project management discipline should be used. We had another question from uh, uh, Nidhi. Is there any provision for estimates or uh, actual dates? Is there a separate interface? Yes, there is a feature available. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my project just to demonstrate that particular feature. So let me create a new plan so that I can just tell you how this can be done. So let me say I have two tasks in my talk activity. So let me say prepare and I uh, have another task called review. And uh, both these activities, uh, I'm just going to have some estimates. And let's say the first activity is five days and the second activity is also five days. What I've now done is I've just added some estimates for these two tasks. And um, this is more at a planning level. So your question is more about how do I do recording? Is it in the same place where I just entered my estimates? So just to give you a flashback, uh, if you look at MPP, right, the Microsoft project, there are different components through which it simplifies the data. One is through views. As you can see, there is a view available, what you're able to see to your left hand side called the Gantt chart. So this view will allow you to simplify the data that is shown on your screen. But within each view, there are different sets of data that can be displayed. The current data, what you're seeing is more your current plan of your project. But your question is more about how do I look at uh, recording your actuals, for which I recommend there is a, another component in Microsoft project called tables. A table is ideally a, a layout, or you can just say it is a collection of tables, it's a collection of columns that are grouped together that will allow you to do different jobs at different phases of your project. Currently, the table what you're now looking at is shown here. As you can see, the current table is called as the entry table. So the entry table is what we currently use for planning purpose. Coming back to your question on tracking, you just need to change the table to tracking year. Now you are able to see the view is still Gantt chart, but uh, you are able to see there are different columns that are being displayed. So now I can ideally say this activity is 100% complete. Okay, I'm just going to say it is 100% complete and I can just say this activity took around 6 days to complete. So as you can say, this is the way by which you can record your actuals as a part of your project plan. Now let me move on to the next one. What is the logic Microsoft project uses when I select as soon as possible or as late as possible constraint type? 
That was a very good question. Okay, now let me go back to my project. So I'm just going to go back to my uh, old project now. Okay, so fine. So the difference between forward and backward scheduling, or as soon as possible and as soon as po later as possible, is what this question is. So I'm just going to take uh, three tasks. Let's say I have a, a workshop. I need to prepare a document. I need to review a document, and I need to approve it and uh, I have some kind of a go live date okay so currently if you look at it I've just entered my task names here okay and um, by default all these tasks are manually scheduled which means I need to make it to auto schedule for this constraint type to work so let me make it auto schedule and I'm just going to have some durations for these activities let's have the same numbers one day one day and let me set some predecessors for it so after the workshop, I will prepare the document. After preparing the document, I will review it. I can do an approval, let's say, only after the workshop. And the go live will happen only after my review and approval, which is 3, 4. So this is how my activities are getting connected. So if you just observe to your right-hand side, the way in which our activities are scheduled, I just want you to focus on maybe the 2, 3, and 4. You can see the moment the first activity finished, the remaining activity starts as soon as possible. This is the default behavior of your project. So how does project know where, where do I change it? Whenever you create a blank project or a new project in Microsoft Project, there is an option called project information. On the project information, there is a small drop-down available called a schedule from. By default, whenever project schedules from the project start date, all your activities are scheduled as soon as possible which means the moment the predecessor completes, the successor immediately starts. So there is no kind of uh, delay in it. And that is what you are trying to experience here. So you can see my approval activity. You can see this activity starts as soon as possible the moment my workshop completes. But the question what I had is, what is the difference between as soon and as late? So I'm just going to go to the approval activity. I'm going to double click approval. And on the advanced tab, I'm just going to change it from as soon to as late, which means this activity will not start on the early start and the early finish. Rather, it will start as late as possible without affecting my project finish date, which means you will see this activity will now start as late as possible, which means it will start on Friday. So let me say OK. I hope now you are able to find this activity is starting as late as possible. Let me give you another demonstration. Let me say if my prepared document duration gets revised from one day to five days, which means my review will also get pushed by a later date, but my approval is going to start as late as possible, which means now you are able to see my approval is starting as late as possible in this case. Okay? So which means that this particular task is starting as late as possible in this particular case. So as late as possible means this activity is scheduled as per the late start. Whereas when I say as soon as possible, this particular activity is starting on the earliest date as possible. So I hope uh, the question on as soon and as late got clarified now. Fine. Now let me take the remaining questions later, but let me go back to my content. So question three, what I'm going to focus on is there are certain activities in your project that might have more than one resource assigned. But when you have more than one resource with each resource having a different working time, naturally as per the resource calendar only the work will be scheduled. So what we are going to now look at is a scenario where you would like to have a task to be scheduled only on a specific working time. How do we do this? So I'm just going to go back to my project. So let's take an example from this current project itself. So you can see there is an activity called uh, prepare document. Okay, and uh, let's say I'm going to have two resources here. Let me go to the resource tab and uh, let me have a few resources here. Let me say I have a resource who is an on-site and who is another resource who is an offshore. Okay, so let's say the on-site resource is using the night shift calendar and the offshore resource is using the standard calendar. What I mean by standard and night shift is the offshore resource is going to be following the 8 to evening 5 timing and maybe the onset resource is using the night shift calendar, which is night 
9 to morning 8. So let's make this assumption and I'll go back to my Gantt chart. The first step what I'm going to do is to understand how this works is I'm going to turn on the task inspector in my project 2010. What do I mean by a, uh, what do you what do we mean by a task inspector? The task inspector is ideally a feature that has been added in project 2010 that will allow you to understand what are the different factors that decide the start date of the particular task. So let me first uh, click on the task inspector. So you can find there is an option called inspect. Now you are able to find my prepared document, the calendar that is currently used is a standard calendar. The reason is because the project calendar is currently being used when it schedules this particular task. So let me save this file first before I proceed to the next one. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick one resource here, let's say offshore. The moment I say offshore, you know offshore resource is working as per my standard calendar, which means as per my standard calendar timing only, the start and finish will be calculated. Now you are able to see the calendar now that is being used as an offshore resource. Now let me try to do a window split. On the bottom, I am going to have my, uh, let's say, the task usage. And now you would be able to better understand how this works. Now you are able to find this particular resource is working as per my standard calendar, which means he spends 8 hours per day on this project. Now I'm just going to assign another resource to this task. Let me say on-site. But you know on-site resource is working as per my night shift calendar. Now you are able to see for this particular task, you have both on-site and offshore. And you are able to find how this work is getting scheduled. You are able to see this particular resource offshore. Resource currently you are able to find is work on-site is going to be for Monday if you look at it, now you are able to see on Wednesday it is only one hour because he is working from 11 p.m. to 12 a.m. and this is how the work is getting scheduled. What we are trying to see here is both these resources, since they are having different working time, naturally as per their resource calendar only this particular task is scheduled. Maybe you have a requirement that this document needs to be prepared only during a night shift timing. So which means the resource calendar should ideally be ignored in this particular case. How do we do that? I'm going to double click this particular task on my advanced tab. I'm going to change my calendar where I can say in this uh, at a task level the calendar should be used is my night shift calendar which means though I have a resource assigned to this particular task like offshore and on-site, I ideally want only the night shift calendar for scheduling this particular task. And also I need to say the scheduling should ignore the resource calendar which means the resource availability will not be considered when it schedules this particular task. I just want everybody to observe what happens to the calendar on my task inspector and how is the work getting scheduled for both these resources now. Now you are able to find on the factors affecting, you can see the task calendar night shift is being used and you are able to see both these resources are now pushed to work during the uh, night shift calendar because I have tried to say this task needs to use the night shift calendar for scheduling this particular task. So just to summarize, this is how you need to do it. Naturally, at, uh, by default, the work is scheduled as per the resource calendar. If the task calendar needs to be taken as a priority, I recommend using the task level task information form and go to the advanced tab. That's where you can assign this task calendar. So the next question what I'm going to take is uh, how do we create a burn down chart? This is one of the questions which came from our participants, how to create a burn down chart. Uh, so in project 2013, okay, so that's the next version that's not released from Microsoft. It is still in the final stages. So in project 2013, this burn, burn down chart is automatically available. Whereas if you are using the project 2007 or project 2010, you might need to do a few of uh, you might need to do a few customizations to get this burn down report charts so uh, let me go to a report so let me first uh, run through a few reports first
So what I have is a very a small sample plan, okay? So let's say that we have recorded the actuals as a part of your project plan, and you would like to, you would like to know the burn down uh, chart for it. I hope all of us do know what a burn down chart is. It just tries to look at uh, um, a trend over how much of work is available and uh, over time till the project completion. So the way you need to do it in project 2010 is you need to go for the visual report. So go to the project ribbon and you have a reports option where you need to click on visual reports. The moment you click on visual reports, go to the, uh, go to the new template option and where you need to select the assignment usage. Okay? The reason why I'm selecting assignment usage is you might want to more look at the low level data of your project through which you will be able to understand your burnout. And let me say, okay. So what now what project does is it exposes data to an Excel spreadsheet where it draws a pivot chart for you. So let's give some time for project to create this. So as you can see, there is nothing drawn automatically. So I need to pull it. So the first step, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw my burn down chart by a weekly manner. So let me put my week labels here. So this is my weeks in my project. The second is I might want to look at my cumulative work, what I've spent so far in my project. So let me say cumulative work. The next one is I need to look at my actual work which I spent in my project and my baseline work. And I'm just going to push my values to the column labels so that you are able to clearly see for each week in my project what is the cumulative work what is the actual work I spent on those weeks and what has been promised to the customer. So this, this is what it is. So you can see the cumulative work is shown, but we don't have a cumulative work for actuals and baseline. So I'm going to just uh, write a formula here to create this. So let me say, I'm going to say cumulative actual work. And let me have another column called cumulative baseline work. Okay, so I'm just going to write a very simple formula here. I'm going to say it is sum of, so, so you need to say dollar E dollar three colon E three. So let me write that. So what does this imply? I'm just going to sum from E3 to E3, where the first E3 is ideally the constant. So I'm just going to pull it. You are able to see it will ideally match with my grand total, because this is my cumulative actual work. So you can see the remaining rows of formulas would have ideally changed relative to, whereas the first part is going to be fixed, because I have prefixed it with dollar. So in terms of uh, baseline, cumulative baseline, I'm trying to write a similar formula. Sum of uh, $f$3 colon $f3. And let me try to pull this. Okay. So this is my cumulative uh, baseline work. So I got my cumulative work, my cumulative actual work, and my cumulative baseline work. When it comes to burn charts, you might ideally want to compare your remaining actual work with your remaining planned work. So I'm just going to write another uh, formula here called remaining actual work, where I'm going to say the remaining actual work is, uh, as you know, the remaining actual work is accumulated work is 668. So I'm going to say 668 minus my cumulative actual work. So that is 668 minus G3. Okay, now I'm just going to do the next one, remaining uh, planned work. 
where I would ideally say the baseline work is 616 minus 44. So this is my remaining planned work and my remaining actual work. But you can see that uh, uh, as you can see my actual, I've not performed anything on these weeks. So it's better that on those days I remember I remove my uh, remaining actual work here because it might be a bit misleading for you to understand what is the remaining work. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to so I'm just going to insert a column here called uh, um, week so that you will be able to draw the graph. So let me insert a column called week and let me say the week is 2, 3, yeah. So let me repeat it what I did. I had the cumulative work, the actual work and the baseline work and uh, now I have the actual remaining actual work and the remaining planned work. So I'm just going to draw a graph for these two. So I'm just going to select it. Sorry. I'm just going to select uh, these columns and I'm going to say insert pivot chart. I'm going to say new sheet. Let me say OK. So let me say weeks. Now let me change the chart type to this. Okay. Now I hope you're able to see the burn down chart that is available. So the blue color line, what you see here, is your remaining actual work. As you after this point, you see there is a disconnect because I have not performed. Uh, I'm, there is no actuals after this point in time. Whereas the the red color line ideally tells the remaining planned work as per what you promised to the customer. So if you want to meet this target, the difference here right, which is uh, maybe around uh, 200 hours or 200 days, needs to be met in order to meet what has been expected from the customer. So this is how you ideally need to create a burn down chart in terms of your project. So let me go back to my Q&A. So let's take a few more questions. Okay. Okay. How do I show dependency on a previous task or a dependency of a subtask? How do I show dependency on a previous or depend? I hope, okay, so that was, a, a, that is pretty much easy. So I'm just going to go back to my uh, project. Um, so let's say if I have two tasks here, let's say uh, prepare and I have another task called review. By default, these two activities, there is no dependencies here. So if you want to set the dependencies, make use of the predecessor column where you can just key in. The review should be starting only after prepare is completed. So I can just say 7. Another way by which you can set your predecessors or successors is on your view ribbon, there is an option called details. So you can just click on details through which on the bottom also you can set your predecessors and successors. Okay. So I hope uh, this uh, would have uh, helped it. Nice. Okay. Now let me move on to the next one. I would like to know how schedule baseline concept can it be used in project 2010 when the estimates get changed during project execution. Okay. Okay. So is email functionality available in project so that we can fire email to the respective resources on the planned dates. Okay. Um, the option, what you are talking, okay, let's take the first one. Uh, uh, how do we take care of uh, updating your baseline for uh, new changes? Okay, so I'm just going to go back to my project. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, remove these set of activities. Okay. Sorry, let me close this plan.
So let me open a new plan now. Okay. Fine. Let's say that we have a, a, a few activities here. Let's say we have uh, activity A, B, C, and D. Okay. And let's say this activity sequence this way: uh, two days, uh, two days, for five days, and two days. And I have set my dependencies for my activities here. So I'll just say one, one, two, comma three. So I'm just going to set some resources for these activities, or I might uh, directly go for the baseline so that you know how it works. The first step is you need to understand uh, the data what you're seeing on the screen. On your view ribbon, you can see that table that is being used is the entry table, which means this is the table that we ideally use for uh, changing your plan or for updating your estimates. Now let's say we are going to do a baseline of your project. So I'm just going to go to the project ribbon, and there I will say set baseline, set baseline. So this option should ideally be used for doing your baseline or for updating your baseline. So let me say baseline, and I will say entire project. So the moment you do it, you don't see any change on your current screen. The reason is because baseline is more internal to your MPP file. It will not be shown on your current screen. If you want to look at your baseline data, I suggest that you go to the format ribbon, where you can see I want to show I want to see the baseline data on my screen. Now, to your, towards your right, you are able to find there are some black color bars that are being displayed, which indicates that those activities are currently being uh, baselined as a part of your project. Coming back to your question, you ideally said, how do we take care of changes as a part of your project plan? So, there are two types of changes that might ideally happen. One is, you might have an approved change request, or you might add some activities that was not initially estimated. Let's take the, the first one. Whenever there is an approved change request, you might want to incorporate it as a part of your plan. So the first step is you go ahead and add that activity to your project plan. For example, I might want to insert a new task here, let's say a flag or something else. Let me say I'll say flag 1. So the flag is just an indicator. It's a, no, there is no significance on baseline. So we might try to use this particular column to, uh, to flag which of the activity that got impacted because of this new change. So let's say I want to uh, add my new task. So let me, on my entry table, I'm, I'm just inserting a new task. And let me say it is B1. And this activity, I'm going to say this is activity is three days. Or let me say five days. So this is a new task, which needs to be baseline. So I will say yes. The next is I'm going to change its predecessor. I'll say the predecessor of B1 is B. And my uh, that of uh, five, that is B is, um, Three. Sorry, it is three comma four. So the moment you do it, you are able to find these are all the set of activities that got updated. So I will just say these activities should also be baseline. Now you might want to apply the filter saying these are the two tasks that got baseline in your MS project. So let me undo this. I think there was a small typo. Yeah. So these are the two activities that got based, uh, that got revised. So that is row three and row four. So I'm just going to hit this filter, where I will say filter only activities that have been marked as yes. So I'm going to select only those two tasks that got impacted because of this change request, and I will go for the project, and I will say set baseline again. Now you might be a bit confused. Should I say baseline or should I say selected task? I recommend that. You go, you go for the entire project only once. But in this case, it's only selected task that got updated. So go, just go for the selected task option. Just go for a selected task option here. And you just need to say, roll that data that is being selectively baseline to its summary task. What does this mean? So when we turn on the project summary task, for example, and uh, I just look at my baseline. duration, you're able to see my current estimates are only nine days initially. But when this, these two are getting updated, I, I might want to revise my level zero project baseline duration also. So for which go to the project ribbon, I'll go to the set baseline, where I will say selected task and roll it up to all the summary tasks. And let me hit the OK button. 
So the moment I do it, these two tasks will be baselined and even the summary task baseline data will get recalculated. So I will say yes. Now you are able to find even my summary task baseline is getting updated. So this was the question which was about baselines. Okay, so the next question what I had was, uh, uh, is there any provision by which we can send emails from Microsoft projects automatically as reminders? So this option is available only in project server. On a standalone desktop, there is no option by which we can directly send emails to the resources. So that option is not available. So now let me go to the next question. Uh, how do we use PERT estimation tool? Okay. Uh, the challenge what I have is in project 2010, PERT has been removed. Okay, so PERT is no more supported as a part of your project 2010. But I can give you a demonstration in project 2007 at a later point in time where how to do PERT estimate. Okay, and uh, let's go to the next question. Yeah, EMV. Okay, EMV will be parked. Is it possible to perform risk management activities in Microsoft project? namely for example identifying, highlighting, evaluating, monitoring and handling risks. Okay, that was a good one. So uh, his question was about how do you do risk management as a part of your project plan. As such if you look at it, there is no option by which you can do risk management. So when we talk about risk management, uh, there are different aspects to it. If you go by the process, there is a, as per the project management body of knowledge, it says we start with the risk identification, then we do a risk assessment, and then we do a response and a monitoring and tracking. So when we look at identifying risk, uh, in terms of schedule, you can identify risk. For example, uh, let's say if this is my project plan, and ideally I want to look at uh, uh, whether this activity is going to create uh, uh, an impact on my project finish date. As you know, my critical path can generally be used as a technique for identifying whether it will have an impact or not. For example, let's take the execute system test cases. As you can see towards my right, this activity is 0% complete. If you ideally want to know whether this activity is going to create an impact on my project finish date or not, let's say if I'm revising its duration uh, from 8 days to the most uh, pessimistic value, let's say to 15 days. The moment I make it to 15 days, you are able to see my project finish date is automatically getting revised. So you know that this activity, in case if it is having a high uh, uncertainty, naturally it's going to have an impact on my project finish date. On the other way, let's look at my unit test code, okay. Um, let's say this activity write code, currently it's estimated as 7 days. If I just change it to let's say 5 days, you are able to see its start date or finish date is only getting impacted, my, but my project completed date is not getting impacted. So you can try to do a what if analysis to identify which activities got impacted as a part of your project plans, okay. So that could be a very nice way by which you can do it. But uh, coming down to a concept like I can say prioritization of risk or running a simulation or a Monte Carlo, that is not available as such directly in Microsoft Project 2010. But there are third party tools available like Risk Plus, At Risk, you can do a Google search on it and all those products are licensed products, they are not freely available. So you can try to dry load a trial version of it through which you can try to run a simulation of this complete project giving some uh, the um, the three-point estimates for all these activities through which you can try to know the favorable duration you need to commit on, on this particular project. Okay, how do we track plan date and the actual date as a part of uh, can we maintain two dates for a task? One is plan date, one is actual date. Uh, this was a question from uh, one of the participants, so let's, okay. I hope I made this point earlier, okay, so currently we are looking at an entry table which you know what an entry table is. Your entry table is your current plan which will contain your current start date, your current finish date which includes even your actuals. If you want to look at what has been promised to the customer, that is what we mean by baseline. So just to take an example, I remember we baseline this current project, right, I remember we baseline this. So if you want to look at my baseline data of this current project, uh, you can just change the table uh, which you are looking at from entry to what we call as baseline. So the way you do it is go to the more tables and you have a table called baseline. So the baseline table when you click on apply, this is what has been promised to the customer. Whereas the entry table what you are looking at is this is what you are currently executing. 
But if you want to look, if you want to record your actuals, which is the actual start date and the actual finish date, go back to the tables where you need to go to the table called tracking. On the tracking table, you can record your actual start and your actual finish. So just to give you a recap, make sure that you record your actual start and your actual finish through your tracking table. Make use of your baseline table. Uh, make use of your uh, baseline table to know your what has been committed to the customer. Know that is what your promises are. So based on what has been promised to the customer and what you have recorded on your uh, tracking, your entry table will be able to predict your current start date and the finish date of your other activities. So this is how your scheduling ideally works in project. There was another question, how do we plan the revamp baseline, re-estimated of major chance when a project is of 30%. Uh, uh, I, I just explained that you just need to select only those impacted activities in your project and you need to re-baseline only those selected activities. Okay, that's good. So now there are a few questions that was not answered, okay, as a part of uh, this one. So let me remove those questions what I have already answered. Okay, good. So there are there are three questions left now in my Q and A now. So let me go back to my presentation. Okay, so I'm just going to skip these things because I'm just going to focus more on the questions that has been asked through the Q and A. There was a question on the earned value management or how do we do that as a part of your project, MS project. Um, just remember, for earned value management to work, there are two important things which you need to have in your project. The first one is you need to have your cost information of your resources. Point two is you uh, need to have a baseline in your project. Because earned value management is all about measuring the performance of your project based on what has been approved by the customer and how you are currently doing with respect to your project. So let me go back to my project plan now. I'm just going to take the same set of data. So let's say that uh, this is the plan where I need to record my, my actual. So though I have already baseline it, I'm just going to key in a few set of resources here. So let's say in my resource sheet, I have a few resources. Let's say R1 and R2. And let's say the rate is um, $1 per day and $1 per day. So which means for every one day expense in this project uh, on a task, ideally, is cost is $1 per day. So I'm just going to go back to my Gantt chart where I'm going to randomly assign these resources. So let me insert the cost column so that you can understand how this cost gets accumulated. So let me choose a few resources. You are able to see the cost now column gets uh, automatically calculated based on the resources what I'm assigning. So now you are able to see the total project cost is around $28. So I'm just going to baseline this project again because I need to have my baseline data, which is my baseline cost. Now my baseline cost will be zero because I have not uh, baselined this project with cost information initially. So let me go to the project. I'll say set baseline and uh, I'll say the entire project again. So now you see this is what has been baselined by us and this is what your current cost is. Now as such you will see both will look very similar, but after you have recorded actuals, you will see the cost figure will ideally change, whereas your baseline cost will still be $28. Now let me record some few actuals first. The first step is I will go to the, um, uh, the table called tracking. That's where we need to record your actuals. Let me say this activity is 100% complete. Let me say I'm just going to the uh, task where I will say this activity is 100% complete. The moment I say 100% complete, you're able to see the cost gets automatically calculated because it is a two days task, it is two dollars. Let's say due to some reason, this activity took around five days to complete. Okay, and uh, so now you can see the cost gets automatically adjusted accordingly. 
So now let's say this is, um, let's go to the next activity. Let's say this activity is around 50% complete. Okay, so for this automatically the cost gets calculated. But for earned value to work, ideally there is a, there is a, a attribute which you might be interested on called as physical percent complete. Physical percentage complete talks about how much of real work has been accomplished in this project. For example, let me say the task A is all about creating a document. You might say this activity is five days complete, uh, which, which means the document is also complete. So let's take the next task, B. Let's say for activity B, you might want to prepare a prototype. Though you have a remaining one day to be completed, the real work that has need to be accomplished in terms of prototype is only 25% that's been completed. So you might say this activity, physical work that has been completed is only 25. Reason is because when it comes to earned value, you would ideally want to look at what is the value what I have earned for the real work that has been completed, but not based on the duration what I have spent on that particular task. So now I have recorded it. So once you have recorded this piece of information, the next step is you might want to say these two tasks or all the tasks in your project needs to use an earned value method. So I'm just going to say earned value method. The earned value method that is by default used by all these activities is percentage complete which means the earned value will be calculated more on the percentage complete rather than the physical percentage complete by default. So let me try to say it is physical percentage complete. And uh, let me say this activity is 125, okay. Now to know what is the earned value of this particular project, I'm just going to change my table from tracking table to what we call as earned value. So let me say it is earned value and let me say apply. Now we are able to see there are a few set of columns that are being displayed here. The first column says planned value, which means this is what was budgeted initially. Whereas the earned value tells you what has been based on the work that has been accomplished, this is what it is. But let's look at B. If you look at B, I can see that uh, this particular activity, the earned value is only around 50 percentage complete. When I say 50 percentage, which is, uh, that is only 50.5 dollar, uh, which means it's only 25 percentage complete. So which means on a $2 work, only, 20, only uh, $0.5 work has been really accomplished in terms of this particular activity. So you might want to make use of this earned value table to understand how cost gets calculated. So now let me try to Now you are able to see the earned value is getting calculated. But you might see the planned value if you look at it, except the first task, the other task, the planned value will be zero. Because the planned value is based on your baseline and it is with respect to your status date. Remember status date is the date when you have recorded your actuals. As you can see, it is assumed that I have recorded actuals till, let's say, September 25th. So let me go to the project ribbon and where I will say on the project information, where I will say my status date is 25th or 27th of September. So the moment I do it, you are able to see my planned value is getting automatically calculated. But as on that date, the value what I earned is only $22.5, but with respect to my planned value, I have, I have a budget of around $22. So if you want to look at more in a graphical manner, you can just go to the same project ribbon where you have the visual reports, where you can try to look at the earned value over time report. So let me click on view. So this will export the value what we have calculated now and just tries to project it through a pivot chart for us. So now I need to express this more by a weeks so that you are able to understand it. Maybe you are not able to see the complete graph here. The reason is it is more at a week level. For example, if I'm just pushing it more at a day level, you would have much better data about this particular project. So let me first uh, go back to my tool. I'll just say by days and let me do a view. Okay, I'll just say no.
Okay, now let me go back to my assignment usage and let me break it to this. Now you are able to see on those individual days what is the earned value, planned value and actual cost is shown and now that is shown to you in a graphical manner. So, so the key steps what I just did was um, for each of the activities make sure that uh, on your tracking table you record your physical percentage complete also. And after which you need to tell for this individual activities you need to say the earned value method is physical percentage complete and you need to change your table from your tracking table to your earned value table to uh, know what is the earned value of your current project. So now let me move on to the next questions. Okay. So the next question what I had was uh, what are the other metrics that is possible through Microsoft project. Uh, one of the apart from earned value then other metrics which you can look at is more in terms of work and effort. For example, there are two ways by which you might want to look at uh, the performance of your project. One is more at a task level and another is more at a resource level. For example, at a task level if I want to look at the reports or you want to look at the metrics, I suggest you change the table to what we call as the variance table. This variance table will give you the comparison between what has been promised to the customer and how you are performing. So the start variance and the finish variance will tell you how much days you are behind your project. So this is more at a task level. So if you want to more look at at the cost level how I have performed, I can just change the table to cost. So this will tell you with respect to baseline how I performed. So it is $28 is what is promised, but this is how you are performing with respect to your project. So which means you are overshot your budget. The, with respect to resources if you want to look at, just change your view to the resource sheet and you can just change the table within your resources from uh, entry to cost which means it will tell you each of the resources what was the cost that has been approved for them but how much did they take actually and what is the remaining uh, remaining uh, cost available for them individually. And you can just change the table here to work also so that you will know how much percentage of work has been completed by them individually. So as you can see you can just change the tables and the views to understand how it works with respect to your Microsoft project. Okay, so I'm just going to run through a few set of reports. Maybe uh, this is, could be a very common requirement for some of you. How to add overhead tasks to your Microsoft project. So I'm just going to go back to my project plan. Uh, uh, let's say in my current project you have a overhead activity. Let's say um, we have a task like uh, PM time. The project manager time needs to be spent throughout this project. Ideally when the project length increases or decreases accordingly the length of this task should change. I found a lot of times when people start using uh, uh, they try to add a task manually so they try to have a new task here for example they might say the new task is let me zoom in first so they might have a new task like PM time and they will ideally say this task is taking around uh, for example they will say 44.3 days. So now we are able to see this task stretches from the start date till the finish date. But the only challenge they are having here is whenever my critical path is ideally changing for example if I say my execute system test cases is now taking 10 days you are now able to see my 44.33 days will not get revised because it is no more connected with my project now. So the way you need to do it is you just need to copy this. So I'm just going to select my level 0 project duration that is 46.3. I'll go to the task ribbon where I will say just copy it and I'll go to the PM time that's a new task that is an overhead task for me and I will just say paste special and I will say paste it as a link. When I paste it as a link internally Microsoft project does know from which particular field it was getting copied. So let me say OK. So the advantage is when my critical path is getting changed, let's say from 8 days to I'm just changing it to let's say 4 days. Now you are able to see automatically my PM time is getting revised automatically. So this is one way by which you can try to do it. But you need to remember that this particular task, the task type should be of fixed units. What I mean by fixed units is 
on that particular task, the PM time, the task type should be fixed unit. For example, if I have it as a fixed duration, which means the duration is not flexible. I always recommend it have it as fixed units because you always give the freedom to or the duration or the effort to ideally change with respect to this particular task. Okay. So now let me check if I have any more questions as a part of my chat. Good. So the last question what I had as a part of this was in terms of my PERT. So I just need to close my Microsoft project to explain that. So let me go to this project 2007. Okay, so I open 10. Okay. So now I have my project 2007 open now. So in my project 2007, let's say if I want to do a PERT estimate, you just need to key in a new set of tasks here. Let's say prepare and review. And I just have a few set of tasks with estimates there. So let me click those tasks and link it. So if you want to do a PERT estimate, PERT estimate assumes that you know, the best way to do a duration estimates for your task is to look at the extremes in terms of which the task can be executed. So there are three terms that are generally used in PERT called optimistic, most likely, and the uh, pessimistic. So in Microsoft Project, you need to turn on a toolbar. Remember, this option is available only in Project 2003 and Project 2007. So I just need to turn on the PERT analysis. So this will bring up a small toolbar through which you can feed in the uh, three duration estimates. So let me click on my PERT entry sheet, which you are currently seeing on your screen. So here I have my optimistic, expected, and most likely. Remember, the word expected might not sound good for us because as per PERT, expected is ideally calculated based on optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic. Whereas in project 2007, it would have been wrongly labeled as expected. For example, I say for prepare, my optimistic is going to be uh, three days, and my expected is going to, or my most likely is around six days, and my pessimistic is 10 days. And for review, I'm not making any change because I'm fine with my current duration. Once you have entered it, as you would have learned, in PERT there is a weightage available for optimistic, expected, and most like and pessimistic. So the weightage just uh, assumes that you give more weightage for the most likely, that is to the column what I'm selecting. So in case if you want to alter the weights, click on the set PERT weights on your toolbar where you can just change the weightages. But remember when you change the weightages here, Remember, the sum should add to 6 because this is as per PERT. It is going by a standard deviation where the work is going to be divided across by 6 parts. So let me say OK. Once you are ready with it, I'm just going to do a calculation. On the same PERT toolbar, you can see there is an option called Calculate PERT. Let me click on this. You will, give a, you will get an alert saying that it will try to overwrite some of the data which is available on the fields. Let me say yes. Now you are able to find PERT would up, formula would be internally applied and the formula is 3 plus 4 into 6 plus 10 or in other words it is optimistic plus 4 into most likely plus pessimistic divided by 6 and the total average weighted average is what has been displayed as 6.17 for us for the review this formula would not be applied because I have not provided my optimistic most likely and my pessimistic Okay, so, so that's what I have now. So let me check whether I have a few more questions. Yeah, that's good. So I have answered the questions available on the Q&A now. So just for help you out, guys, so as you know, this is going to be part of the series. So the next session is going to be on October 4th, where we are going to look at how do you schedule your project based on your work breakdown structure and your task dependencies. So that is where we are going to focus on how to build a forecast ready schedule. So thank you guys and um, I hope this uh, I have answered most of your questions. In case if some of your questions are not answered through this forum, please feel free to write an email to me. My email address is sai at sainivas.com. 
If you like this current session or you want to share your feedback, please write it to my email or just visit my Facebook page, Sai the Simple, and please click on like. So over to the moderator. So Mohini, or is anybody there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm really thankful to Mr. Sai for this uh, enlightening session. It was indeed great having you answer the queries from our users. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the session will be available on tegeek.com by tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Grace. Thank you.